So I hand over to you. Okay, great. The slide is viewable. I'm just asking to be on the safe side. Oh no, I must share it. Yes. Oh, you have to. Oh yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you forget such things. So now it's shared. Yeah. Okay. Now it looks like before <laughs> because I was missing the, the 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 pictures of the of the camps on my right side. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Philip, it's up to you. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, yeah, we we are here to talk about the economic landscape uh, of the UAE, and uh, in a more practical sense, um, you know how to start how to start a business in the UAE. Uh, before we do so, let me quickly introduce myself uh, once again. I'm Philip Crater. I'm located uh, in The Hague currently, um, with my focuses being strategy, research, and holdings. Uh, I'm the CSO and vice president uh, of the Asia region uh, for our company MCI CLT. And I, I studied uh, international studies at Leiden University graduated in uh, 2018 with a uh, year study abroad at the Shanghai International Studies University. I think, uh, Martin, you can introduce yourself better than I can. Yeah, um, my pleasure. Good afternoon. My name is Martin Kreta. I'm CEO and Global Head of MCI CLT, uh, the company which I founded myself uh, many, many, many years ago. I am uh, stationed and located in Dubai and Hanoi. Uh, focus in our company is for me, all issues related to law and tax in a, in a corporate background and uh, corporate relations. And as well, the facilitation either in the United Arab Emirates or in other jurisdictions. Um, I studied a little bit longer ago than Philip of course, uh, law and economy in uh, Germany at Ludwig Maximilians University yeah, in Munich. Okay, so before we can now move into the topic, um, let me get some preliminaries out of the way. Um, so I want to be quite clear that we're, we're not aiming to be a, a top-notch scientific research that uh, you could then adapt into a blueprint to be ready to you know, go, go and, and follow it step-by-step step to be able to, uh, you know, to, to open a business and, and everything uh, will work out and you'll have all the answers. But what we want to do is give you a holistic overview of the situation in the UAE. Um, you know, act, act like this hands-on guide and Hopefully, you'll be able to see, you know, both similarities and differences to um, the region or even country, uh, if you are that far, uh, of where you would, for example, be interested, um, you know, to open something and to see what you can apply, uh, what you can, you know, what it makes you think about so that you, you know, just consider things that maybe before you haven't thought of because there are so many things to think about. Right. So... First, uh, let's talk about where the UAE is located. Um, we've chosen here a, a map um, which shows all destination points, all flight route points uh, that can be directly accessed uh, from the DXB Dubai Airport uh, using Emirates. Now, as you can see, that's a whole lot of destinations. And um, this will actually be a, a very critical aspect um, of this presentation and also of why the UAE as a whole uh, is so interesting because just look at the location and, and look how it is, well, essentially in the center of, of any major destination it needs to reach um, and that it does so, that the options are there. So do, do keep that in mind as we, as we go through everything. Um, and I think a, a lot of what we talk about will actually make sense if you do keep this image in mind. Right, to give you a good overview, uh, we've conducted a bit of a, a country profile. So we will, we will do a brief check through uh, the macro profile, the history, a socio profile, an economy profile, even look into the government profile a bit, 
So look at the judicial system, which can be quite important uh, when you're when you're looking at at business, and also the taxation and international compliance. Now, for the macro profile, we yeah start here really just with a few figures. Um, these these are I think quite important just to get uh, an, a mental image of you know putting everything that we will say later on into perspective. Um, you know, how 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 much do these numbers actually mean when we then later talk about, you know, achievements and whatsoever. So the population uh, in, in 2020 comes in just shy of 10 million, 9.9 uh, .9 million people. The area uh, with 83,600 uh, square kilometers, it's not actually that big. Um, and if you look at its uh, GDP, we've here used the PPP, um, just for, for better measure, I would say, uh, at 746, uh, yeah, thousand billion, uh, US dollars, uh, it's ranked, uh, 34th with that, uh, according to the IMF, this is a 2019 stat. It could have slightly changed now. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, currently, uh, people are not too worried about economic statistics. Um, this will be probably updated at a, at a later time. Um, and if you break this down to per capita, still looking at the PPP, we're looking at $70,000. So it is, it is quite a, a rich nation per head. Uh, the global rank suddenly jumps to six. It's uh, quite different than 34, I would say. Um, the unemployment rate is quite low with 2.6%. And um, in the next slide, this will already make some sense uh, when we when we look through how the country is structured, how it's set up. Uh, it has the an, an FDI inflow of 10.4 billion, and uh, this is something that, you know, over time it should increase uh, with you know new initiatives being formed uh, to attract more industry settlement than now. But uh, I would say that, especially given given its size. You know, this is this is already quite something. Um, the currency it uses is the UAE dirham, uh, which is actually pegged to the US dollar. Uh, this was, you can imagine, for for its infancy stage to 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 get things going, uh, very very good. Uh, it gave it a, a very strong base, um, and yeah, we'll we'll talk about it and consider is that still the case? Is that no longer the case? Uh, briefly later on. The time zone is UTC plus four. So uh, while it's, for example, 9 a.m. for me now, already going into the afternoon there. Um, last statistic I'm, I'm looking at here is uh, the Global Business Complexity Index, uh, which the TMF group brings out annually. It's an independently researched um, you know, statistic where Every year they rank 77 jurisdictions to do business in um, from most complex, which would be rank one to least complex, rank 77. So you would want to have a very high rank in this. And as you can see in uh, 2019, the UAE actually had the complexity ranking of four. That's not very good if you're a business owner. Um, but in 2020, we're actually looking at a massive jump uh, up to rank 53. Um, that has numerous region, uh, re reasons. It's, it's mainly uh, due to yeah, the implementation of regulation, uh, streamlining of regulation that was already in check. Um, but basically what TMF group here finds is that it is becoming increasingly possible, able, easy, smooth uh, to conduct business in, in an appropriate manner there. And yeah, Maybe, maybe this could even get higher in the, in the future years. Uh, this is definitely a, a good upwards trend. Now, to not bore you with too much history, I just quickly want to go through a few, a few main points um, just to understand where this all started and why this growth is so phenomenal. So uh, the United Arab Emirates that exist to now are actually a, a very, very fresh country. Uh, before that, it used to just be a collection of sheikhdoms uh, that worked as tribal states. They, they had a nomadic lifestyle. And uh, in, in the 19th and 20th century, um, 
what, what really was thriving for them uh, was the pearl diving industry, um, as well as, as trades with India, which, you know, later it got somewhat killed off by the Great Depression and um, there were tariffs imposed by India and also on other countries uh, that, that somewhat killed this off, didn't make it viable anymore. Um, during 1922 to 1971, the UAE was actually acting as a, a British protectorate and uh, was under British administration. This was, yeah, due to re reached due to economic deals uh, with the Emirates. Um, but it is it is also to say that the UAE was never a colony of uh, Britain. And then, on the second December of 1971, um, six of the today seven members, the, the Emirates uh, of the Federation, formed together as the UAE. Uh, Ras al Khaimah actually joined uh, only one month uh, later. And yeah, since, since then, they have been, they have been uh, these seven Emirates that in many ways actually do still work on federal level, but uh, yeah, they are united as, uh, as the name proclaims. Um, the last point of, of history I have in here is uh, yeah, sadly, sadly the demise of Sheikh Said bin Sultan Al Nahyan. He was yeah, so he was seen as the founding father uh, of the country, and uh, you know you you could really tell that he made a change, that he had this this attitude about him uh, as a leader that just inherently you know made people trust him, his decisions. Uh, and there was just great affection for him. So it, it was a very sad day when he died on the 2nd of November in 2004. And the country was shook. Uh, and at the, at the time, we, we had moved there uh, not too long before, I believe. And, um, you know, everyone was shook. The, the entire country stood still for, I think, three or four weeks until, you know, things started moving again. And it was really a pivotal moment. Now, I'm not trying to say that things got better or worse, uh, but you could definitely tell something just happened that is really changing, you know, what so far was the face of this. Right. Um, now, I mentioned the unemployment rate, and uh, you can actually kind of already guess why it is so low. If you look at the age permit uh, that I've put here on the right, um, you can see that it's mostly a male working population. And uh, the reason for that is that, well, only 11.5% of the total population is actually made up by UAE citizens, so-called locals. The rest, the 88.5, uh, uh, remain to be, yeah, expats. You have blue collar workers, you have highly trained professional expatriate workers, uh, Everything in there, 88.5%. Uh, it's uh, quite big. Now, the expat structure here uh, is, is already given there uh, with 38.2% coming from India, 102 from Egypt, 9.5% from Bangladesh, and 9.4% uh, from Pakistan, 6.1% from the Philippines, and then the rest, all the other nations, including uh, its GCC neighbors, make up 15.1%. Uh, yeah, and predominantly, you can see it's a 25 to 44 year olds. You know, it's, a, it's a prime working age, especially, uh, you know, physical labor jobs, which uh, is at this moment, uh, you know, almost entirely outsourced. Um, and this, this really flows in with, with these hard working conditions that uh, you can observe there. So, there's a there's very little protection for workers, uh, along with along with really very few, if not any, anti discrimination laws uh, for employment, which uh, clearly favors UAE and uh, GCC nationals, so from the region, uh, over essentially anyone else. And the fact that there are no workers unions um, means that, you know, especially in construction, you you often hear these stories of passports being taken away and very harsh living conditions, uh, having, having to work under the sun in, I don't know, 45, 50 degrees with, with no breaks or very few breaks, uh, 
skipping payments, all of these things. It's a, it's a very nasty situation and uh, it is being addressed. It is being addressed, but at this point in time, it is, it is still an issue. Now, one of the ways that they are addressing it, uh, this, this will not have direct impact on construction, for example, but it does have impact on the private sector as a whole, are emiratization initiatives. Um, the idea is this, that currently the uh, Emiratis, the UAE citizens, are mostly employed in the public sector, in government jobs, um, which due to, due to the lack of anti-discrimination laws in employment, uh, they are predestined to, to work at because they speak the language, they are from the country. So it, it is a very easy process to uh, you know, basically fill all the government uh, jobs with them. But the UAE wants to find more meaningful and efficient ways uh, to, to employ them in public and the private sector. Um, as I think as of now, the private sector actually lags quite behind with uh, only 0.34% of the private sector workforce being UAE citizens. So even compared to the 11.5%, that's very small. And this is something that they're trying to address uh, with these initiatives. Now, to get a uh, overview uh, of the economic situation, a very brief uh, economic profile here. Uh, the UAE is the second largest economy in the Middle East. So the only one that, uh, that topped them there uh, is Saudi Arabia. Uh, and looking at it globally, uh, if we're looking at GDP per capita, now this is the nominal value, not the PPP value. Uh, they are the 24th largest globally. Uh, they are by now member of a, a lot of international institutions and groupings. Uh, we've listed a few here, the UN, the IMF, WTO, WHO, of course the GCC and OPEC. Um, this is just to, to give you, you know, give you, give you, give you insight into that. They are part of uh, these institutions. Um, they are still very, very heavily dependent on oil and gas exploration. And although it's an outdated stat, I think this statistic shows this quite well. Uh, in, in 2010, 85% of the UAE economy was based on oil exports, 85%. So, you know, that's, that's essentially everything. Um, the clear exception here is Dubai. And uh, it is to say that the country as a whole is moving away from that and it is boosting um, diversification attempts to move away from that. Uh, in Dubai, for example, right now it's only 5% of the GDP. So that sounds a lot better already than 85%. Um, these diversification efforts uh, have started in yeah, quite, a, quite a few sectors and you can definitely witness them in trade and distribution, uh, but also especially in tourism the uh, yeah, MICE, which is meetings, incentives, conferencing and exhibitions, um, but also real estate. Uh, there's a, there's a you know, booming real estate market. Sure, right now, given the conditions, uh, things are changing a bit. Um, but all in all, if we you know, especially look over the trend since the uh, financial crisis, um, I would say it is, it is a booming thing that they really try to push and that they try to diversify into. Uh, and then we have communications infrastructure and also technology. Um, technology will be quite a, a vital point uh, for, for the presentation. You will see that this is really what the UAE is banking on in terms of uh, diversification efforts. Now, uh, overall, all things considered, uh, the UAE is uh, seen as yeah, one of the most open economies in the 2020 uh, index of economic freedom. They actually ranked 18, uh, isn't too bad, right behind the USA at uh, 17. And, and what makes them so strong and what gives them this space is their strong focus on infra and urban structures. So if you were to, to look at, for example, a Google Maps at night, um, of, of the road network where you see everything lit up. Uh, it is, 
it is really, you know, you can say worldwide a, a leading road network. Um, it is crazily connected, um, you know, crazily worked out, but it, somehow it works and uh, it works well. Uh, there are by now four international airports. Uh, we've already mentioned the, the flight map uh, of DXB uh, with Emirates earlier, um, but there are more, you know, and it's a small country, but the fact that after one very big airport, we can still talk about three more um, is already quite significant. And uh, it, it does aid towards being this, this linking point in the region and being able to, to be an easy access point for many places. Uh, also, as you may know, there are a lot of skyscrapers and therefore they also have very high rankings in, in tower statistics. There's a lot of high rise business buildings and a, a lot of attractions as well. Um, they are already at this point uh, among the strongest and most diversified hubs. Their air, sea and uh, road infrastructures are just beyond great. Um, the rail system, we don't really need to talk about. It is, it is definitely more of, a, of an embryo stage of a, of a start um, and didn't really, didn't really exist uh, up until uh, you know, very, very close in, in the past. Um, but the one thing that will strike you, and I will hopefully mention this more than enough, uh, is the ambition to aim higher, to do more, to get further. And that is really uh, what sums up not just the economy, but uh, essentially everything around the UAE and its secret behind growth and progress. Yeah, uh, I want to come over to the briefly to the government profile, to the profile which uh, starts also with some sentences and some information about the political system. It's a quite unique political system because we have here, I tried to summarize it with a sentence, it's an emirate-wise grouped constitutional monarchies in plural with topped up federal institutions under a president which forms then a federation. Uh, we have to see, we talked about it, seven emirates. Every emirate has got its, his own ruler, which is, of course, a family inheritance issue. And it's a clearly monarchy structure in these emirates, but more the nomad or Arabian way. So go back and don't forget that this all comes from a tribal living situation, from tribal living conditions, where the so-called sheikh was the head of the tribe. So this is phenomenal that seven of these small kings found a way to, to form a federation. And they do it uh, with two institutions on federal level, which play the major role. This first is the Supreme Council. That is exactly the, uh, yeah, the, 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 the meeting and, and uh, the, the council of these seven rulers, where they elect the president and the vice president of the federation for a five years term. Um, okay, they elect, but unwritten rules are telling them that the president has to be always the ruler of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, which is the richest Emirate and also uh, on the land, on the map, the largest Emirate and where Sheikh Zayed uh, Al Nayan comes from, the founder of the nation. But they also have the unwritten rule that the vice president has to be from the ruler from the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, uh, of Dubai, sorry. Um, and since 2006, vice president and prime minister are being are served as functions in a personal union of the ruler of Dubai. Means the ruler of Dubai, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, is the prime minister of the federation and he appoints his, uh, appoints his council of ministers and forms by that the cabinet which makes all the day-to-day -day decisions and the leading and guidance 
in all feder federal uh, aspects. Beneath that, there is a federal national council, which could be seen as a kind of parliament. It has got 40 delegates. That's not very much for a, for a parliament, indeed, but it is a small country. Uh, in the beginning, the delegates in the FNC have been simply appointed by the rulers. They had a pro rata scheme and say, OK, according to our population, in the Emirate and so on. The one is giving 10, the other one is the same like we have it actually in the US elections where you have delegates per country or per, per state, uh, which is independence of the population numbers. Since 2006, they invented or introduced their elections. Um, currently, 50% of the seats are being voted by an election. Of course, only UAE citizens can join that election, not the expatriates. We have here no voting rights. And 50% remain appointed by the rulers. Um, what are they doing? They make a little bit legislation examination. They give advice to the cabinet. Uh, they care for accountability for the system. This is all a little bit this majlis orientation. A majlis is a, is a big welcoming room you have in your house where normally the head of the house on a weekend day is receiving his neighbors, his friends, sometimes his employees, uh, other family members for an information of exchange. This is what they are doing. So it's not an electing parliament. Um, the general plus point uh, with regards to the government profile is that you find here in this country a very, very great affection towards the leadership and also towards the institution. And that not only amongst the UAE citizens, also you can see it really at every point amongst the expatriates. So this affection plays a big, big role, for example, to push through new decisions and developments and changes where you have here hardly no resistance against it, against it of whatsoever kind. Um, just some sentences about the judicial system. Uh, the constitution of 1971 determined uh, right from the beginning a division into local and federal courts, which is remarkable, again, with view to the size of the country. So you have here a separation into local emirate-wise courts and federal courts. Uh, under the so-called Sharia law, which is an uh, Islamic law with an underlying law school very near to the French or continental law school, mainly defined uh, historically seen in Egypt, because Egypt is in the Arab world, I would say, the cradle of law definition. Um, and the federal courts are uh, end up in a Supreme Court, which is located in Abu Dhabi. But, and here comes again a little bit federalism or federal uh, situation uh, into the role. The Emirates Dubai and Ras al Khaimah maintain their local judicial system with an exclusion of the Supreme Court. Means they have their three instances, first instance, appeal and cassation, and there is not any way to go further up with a court case to the Supreme Court. This can take place only in the other Emirates. UAE's financial free zones, we come later to that definition, what it is. They established their own legislation and judicial system, including their own courts. Here is the law school and the law thinking, uh, more the common law, which comes more from the, from the British and Commonwealth area. Um, and the procedures are in English language only, while, of course, in local and federal courts, Arabic is the court language in oral and written. The local and federal laws and courts are here in these financial free zones extra excluded, fully intentionally. It's not an uh, autonomous development or something like that. It has got to do with investor attractiveness. Various other free zones, meanwhile, we have a lot, you will see that later, uh, are also ambitious to establish at least 
judicial executive in form of arbitration uh, committees and courts, smaller courts within their boundaries. Another strong trend since a couple of years is alternative dispute resolution, which was somehow a result of the situation that court cases here took very long time and are quite expensive. So we have here more and more institutions established which try an arbitration and mediation before it comes to the really hardcore court case uh, to shorten and ease these disputes at the end of the day also financially. Okay. And now uh, just a bit about the tax situation. So generally the UAE is seen uh, as a tax-free country. Uh, however, it's not a hundred percent true. So for example, uh, federal corporate tax laws do exist. They're just not executed unless uh, the exception being oil and gas, banks and insurance uh, and telecommunication. But the, the main selling point, and I think that is what most people would associate with no tax, is that there is no federal or Emirati personal income tax. Um, so that is, that is why you will hear you know, it's a tax-free country, zero tax, all of this. Um, in 2018, they, they even then added a uh, value-added tax. And it, it works just like it works around the world. There are no... Uh, no, two special uh, exemptions or so. Uh, it's it's frankly expect, especially what you would would uh, yeah expect. Um, now there there have been some rumors here and there uh, that this will have to be increased to ten percent over the years because it is another income source income stream uh, for the government. Um, but insofar this hasn't been realized and. Um, at this point, it is it is more fear than uh, than that it's uh, yeah realistic that it will happen. But things here that you will <laughs> hear soon um, they change very fast, so uh, it it could happen. Instead, what's being focused on right now is uh, yeah expanding the network um, in terms of double taxation agreements. So as per yeah essentially this month almost. Um, the UAE has uh, double taxation agreements with 117 countries. It's uh, already quite a variety uh, of, of, of a network and they will only be looking to, to expand this further. Now, of course, you can always get a, an updated uh, list at their Ministry of Finance. We've, we've linked it if you do want to take a look. Um, I think one, one part that stands out, uh, even though you know, people, people will go there having this whole no tax in mind uh, is the very, very swift and agile implementation of uh, compliance standards, of internationally posed compliance standards. So by the OECD, for example, the US, the EU, etc. And this can be seen in, in things like FATCA, CRS, ESR, and now even uh, in October of uh, 2020, um, the UBO register uh, being implemented. So they're, they're very swift with that. It uh, happens very quickly, perhaps even too quickly. That depends. Um, we, will, we will talk a bit more about that at a later point. Yeah, I want to invite you now, let's go shopping. Uh, we call the next chapter the Jurisdiction Hypermarket, UAE, due to the reason that uh, it is one of the rare, rare countries in the world where you have, as you see it listed there, uh, mainland sectors, free zones, financial free zones, and even offshore register in one and the same country. Uh, most of the countries have two elements of that uh, maximum three, but four. Uh, this is really very, very rare. Um, I would like to start the beginning of our tour with the mainland sectors. The mainland, this is a domestic market, the domestic economic jurisdiction is strictly organized on emirate level. Means for the mainland registration and also licensing of a company, 
The seven Emirates maintain their own independent departments of economic developments, and you have to go to that economic development department to register your company, to renew your license, where you are physically located in the Emirate A, B, C, D, E, and so on. The first speciality in the mainland to be seen is that the UAE company law traditionally requires for capital-based companies, that is here mainly in the majority, the LLC or the JSC, joint stock company, um, the UAE company law requires that a minimum of 51% of the shares is owned, are owned by a UAE citizen. This is also sometimes heard as the so-called sponsor principle, um, because it does not mean uh, that just this handful of Emirati citizens are able to be in, let's say, something like 12,000 companies in the mainland, just as an example, that they are all there, the 51% shareholder means 51% investors. That is definitely not the fact. It is, it is a nominal function, so they hold in most of the cases, in the absolute majority of the cases, they hold the shares on behalf of the foreign investors who did set up that company just to fulfill the requirement of that law. Professional firms, branches of, of overseas companies cannot have such a shareholder because they have normally not a share capital. So, but they require, it's more or less the same, a national agent who is appointed and who is the contact person for the authorities when it comes to interaction with that company. We see a lift of this 5149 uh, rules in some fields. This is mainly related and focused on higher foreign direct investments because especially in the mainland sectors, uh, the country learned relatively quickly that international companies are a little bit shy to invest 100% of an investment volume of, let's say, for example, 100 million US dollar, uh, but to give 51% of the shares to a not financially engaged UAE citizen as a shareholder. Um, we have, meanwhile, in these uh, corporations, no minimum capital requirement anymore. It was till some years ago was a relative high capital requirement uh, in the mainland sector. It was, uh, it was an equal of $81,750 to be fully paid up. This has been lifted and has been changed, but not, not two less companies which register new still select for themselves such a minimum capital just to work more serious and more heavyweight. The business activities in the mainland are regulated by a licensing system where you have to select activity codes. There's a huge catalog of activity codes, which you sort them in different kinds of licenses. It could be professional license, commercial, industrial or tourism license. And the license itself to operate the company has to be renewed annually. We have there the first no tax, but we have fees scenario because of course this license renewal is causing every year the payment of so-called license fees to the government for mainland companies generally commercial and office space is mandatory because the commercial space is here in the uae also the parameter for the so-called visa quota means the number of employees you can have as a company because the residencies and visas are in this country ejected or connected to your workplace or to your investment object, like a company. The number of, of visas is defined by the square meter number of space you have rented and which you can prove. This leads also to the situation that shared offices with more than one license are generally or usually prohibited. It, it is also easing here. So they work more and more also in specific fields with virtual mainland licenses. They are becoming a little bit a trend because of digitization and so on. Virtual mainland license means 
that it suddenly is under circumstances possible to work in co-working spaces, in shared offices. And it's very nice summarized in the relatively new development of e-trader, trader or merchant licenses, which existed a little bit longer already, but were only open for UAE and GCC nationals in the beginning to do mainly e-commerce, social media trade, and all that from home without an office. Now it's also opened for expats, and there is no 5149 rule, so it can be held under 100% ownership, foreign ownership. The license focus is here on home, micro, and small businesses, absolutely clearly. That's also the intention of the government to stimulate that sector. Expats, unfortunately, are limited to the rendering of professional services, means this original content of e-trader license, like e-commerce, trade in social media, import and also sales, is still restricted for UAE and GCC nationals only. That is so far the um, mainland sector. Uh, now we come to something which first looks very nice, colorful, and this is a small, a small and a limited and not complete collection of free trade zone logos, which we have here in the country. Free trade zones have to be seen really as the main driver for the economic development of the United Arab Emirates and for the positioning as a global hub, because this free trade zones have started to be developed very early. Uh, in the beginning, out of the motivation to make possible that investors can have 100% foreign ownership. After that, there came much, much more. Actually, we have more than 50 free trade zones in the United Arab Emirates. And the first one was even implemented and established 1985, relatively long time ago. It was Jebel Ali Free Zone in Dubai, which is also the largest fenced free trade zone in the world. We have fenced and unfenced free trade zones, and amongst the fenced ones, it's the largest in the world. It's also directly connected to the Jebel Ali port, which is uh, the largest man-made port. You, you see, we have very often, when it comes to the UAE, we are talking about superlatives, always the largest here, the largest there. We have the highest tower still at the moment. Uh, we have the largest man-made port. This is all what Philip also did cut already a little bit. Uh, this is the ambition and the intention. Um, more than 30 of these more than 50 free zones are alone in the Emirate of Dubai. Dubai was here really the pioneer in developing a clustered and theme oriented structure of uh, really specialized free trade zones um, where you can discuss, does it go not sometimes uh, too far? Uh, because uh, we have, for example, just as one example, we have here a free zone for used furniture trading, where there is for everyone who looks into it, and this free zone is also nearly empty, no, they have no tenants, uh, because what to do with uh, used furniture in international trade, import, export, and so on. The main incentives of free trade zones are first and foremost that there are no import or export customs fees into the free zone inside and out of the free zone except you deliver from the free zone here in the uae mainland then you pay a customs fee of five percent plus five uh, percent vat on that uh, but there is also um, a list of of exceptions when something is, is being seen essential, then it's also customs free. The FTZ guaranteed guarantee for the exemption from corporate and personal tax, usually for more than 15 years, independent if there is an implemented tax or not. So if later on in a tax might be implemented, 
this guarantee should normally count. On the other hand, that the future will show how far is this guarantee then really existing. Yeah, the 100% foreign ownership I mentioned already before is the more or less initial intention why to set up such free trade zones. Um, this is for the independent ent entities, but also for the subsidiaries and the branches. So there's also no national agent required. Um, it is to be seen that the free trade zone is a semi-independent jurisdiction because they have own free zone rules in some of the free zones. They have uh, different uh, labor regulations. They have sometimes also arbitration regulations to avoid uh, mainland court usage and so on. So it's, we call it semi-independent. <clears throat> um, the free trade zones try always to offer most flexible solutions for commercial space. It starts with flexi desks, which can be used eight hours per week per company. Uh, the same with flexi offices goes via, goes further to regular offices, warehouses and plots uh, when you realize an industrial project. But this has to be seen clearly, the commercial space has to be taken in the free zone. Um, and also here is a visa and residency quota determined by the space size. Um, the limitation to operations inside the FTZ, which was originally the case, is also softening. Uh, one big, big sector, for example, service industries of all kinds have meanwhile absolutely no problem to settle in a free trade zone and render their services completely in the mainland. Trade activities still need to be rendered via a dis distributor or via a branch in the mainland, which is a second entity then, of course. And we have first ambitions to define a universal localization, which, which means uh, you are, for example, in Dubai Airport uh, free zone registered as a company, but you prefer to have your office in Jebel Ali free zone, which is 25 or 30 kilometers distance. Uh, that sh shall be in future possible that with one free zone license, you can more or less change the localization into other free zones. Also here is the licensing, like in the mainland, aligned to all different kinds of activities with trading, service, finance, industrial licenses. One exception or one new thing is here the so-called freelancer license, especially for freelancers, for small and micro businesses, where a separate entity doesn't need to be incorporated. The license also needs to be here renewed annually. It is the same effect like in the mainland, okay. We have here annually to pay fees for the renewal of the license. A special thing are financial free zones. This started uh, nearly roughly 15 years ago with Dubai International Financial Center, DIFC. Uh, this was UAE's really first onshore financial center with the ambition and intention uh, to create a work environment, especially for the finance sector, means banks, financial institutions, asset managers, funds, insurances, and service providers. Uh, the start in 2004 was a kind of sluggish, the first couple of years till after the financial crisis 2008, where you can also see it was not a very good time distance to develop a financial center from 2004 till 2008 and then the financial crisis came up. Um, the joke was that in these years DIFC was more the abbreviation for Dubai International Food Court because there was really the situation that the authority issued more licenses for retail and restaurants than for financial institutions, banks, and so on. DIFC has got an independent regulator, which is the Dubai Financial Service Authority, which is also overlooking, uh, overlooking the stock market and birth in Dubai, and is really practicing a very strict compliance regime to keep the level, the quality level, and the standards in that financial center as high as possible. 
they have their completely independent jurisdiction and that is the most important thing and is also the most important thing for international banks and other finance, uh, financial players to select that financial center. They have their own laws from labor law up to corporate law, companies law, and they have their own court system under common law, um, of course, with court language in English and not in Arabic. Um, there is an, an, an global financial centers index, which is uh, rendered every year. And in, 2000, uh, in, in 2020, uh, just issued very freshly 25th of September 2020. Uh, DIFC is on rank 17 globally, so it lost some ranks. It lost also points in the rating, uh, where <clears throat> it might have to do with the COVID situation, uh, with the general downturn a little bit in the economy, which we had also 2019 before COVID came up. Uh, the further development needs to be seen. The IFC is explicitly guaranteeing 40 years zero tax on corporate income to all companies who are settled there. Um, 10 years later, um, the big brother Abu Dhabi followed that DIFC sample and established ADGM, which is Abu Dhabi Global Market, became operational just five years ago. It is the same structure, independent regulator, but another one. Um, it has got an independent jurisdiction with own laws, the own court. In GFCI, it is, of course, not that high in the rank because it's a younger uh, financial center, rank 33. And surprisingly, uh, year on year, they climbed up by six ranks. Uh, from 2019 in comparison to 2020, which has got, I can only guess it has got to do that in a relatively young financial center, you have a stronger move in of new licensees at the moment, so that this is increasing the ranking. They play, that's a special aspect, they play a leading role in digital, digital asset regulation, which they implemented 2018 and are by that as a financial center also highly attractive for crypto companies, means blockchain up to cryptocurrencies. Last but not least, we had it before, are uh, the offshore registers. Uh, offshore registers, we have three of them um, as so-called IBC jurisdictions in Dubai, Ras al Khaimah and Ajman. Um, Offshore companies are per se non-physical entities with a registered office at their registered agent's place. That is something mandatory. The normal usage, uh, at least here in that country, apart from things like money laundry and dealing with weapons and what we all hear in Panama Papers and so on about offshore companies, is uh, the property ownership plays a big role because of the Sharia law and the implemented inheritance law. Most of international property investors prefer to buy their property and hold it via an entity, via an, a, a company which is under another law. Um, holding business plays also a vital role here. Uh, to hold shares in operative companies in international trade companies and so on. Wealth structuring inheritance plays also a big role. Commission trade when you do not yourself box moving, but you arrange contracts between buyer and seller and need a small handy entity to just to issue your commission invoice. And one aspect is also quite interesting uh, intellectual property and licensing to have an offshore company as the owner or holder of intellectual property trademarks patents and so on and to license that out yeah and i added and whatever um advertised ben I see ibc benefits are more or less similar to the same what is advertised by free zone authorities by the mainland there's not not a big difference and a new development is that they work in these IBC jurisdictions hard actually to establish also special rules for trusts and 
foundations. Of course, that is a very complex topic so that the regulators themselves face there at the moment some obstacles. This was a quick run through the UAE hypermarket jurisdiction wide uh, and leads you automatically to the SWOT. Yes, so next we will be really just looking at uh, an, an overview of uh, the country um, set up as a SWOT. So, so what are the main strengths? What are the country's weaknesses? Uh, you know, what could be the opportunities that could lie ahead? Um, but also what, what could threaten uh, the country's uh, progress? And uh, we've mentioned a few things before, but now I want to, I want to really um, you know, go, go through this uh, in, a, in a detailed uh, manner. So to begin with the strengths, um, most certainly uh, the, the infrastructure uh, in regards to, to business and the business facilitation uh, thereof is, is very strong, is very varied. So you've, you've just heard about uh, all these, these different uh, hypermarket uh, scenarios um, where really whatever you could imagine needing as a, a structure, uh, you know, you'll be able to find the right uh, solution, the right jurisdiction for it. Um, another strength I've, I've put down here, uh, zero tax. Now with the asterisks, because I do want to note that just like Martin said, there are a lot of not tax, but fees. You know, I think you'll have to have annual license uh, renewals and whatsoever. Uh, then now slowly you're getting things like the VAT added. So technically it's an incorrect statement to have zero tax, but because it isn't direct income tax, they get to claim that. And I do think that overall um, it is a strength, uh, but what strikes out the most um, to myself is this, this hub geography. Um, it's, it's really, if you think about it, it's unmatched, the, the, the connectivity as this geographic center of the globe. Um, that also makes really just excellent use of this situation, of this advantage, uh, with the already mentioned very strong airport system um, and with, with, you know, just, just in general, uh, using every bit of this uh, geographic situation as their advantage. Now, the, the next big strength that I see is that geopolitically, the country is very, very stable. Um, in the region, that isn't actually, you know, the most normal thing. Uh, they are surrounded or, or they're located in a region uh, that can be seen as quite turbulent, uh, but they themselves often act as uh, this, uh, they act as this solid rock um, that leaves, Yave, you are overriding the slide. I don't know what you selected in your sharing, sorry. Um, they can, so they can really be seen as this this solid rock um, that kind of lets the waves uh, splash off of its, of its turbulent neighbors um, and is unmoved, unchanged from that. Uh, and the two last big advantages uh, are in oil and tourism. Uh, these two sectors are so strong. And, um, you know, like, like I said uh, earlier that uh, the UAE does still have a huge dependence on oil. Um, at the same time, this has to do, uh, you know, with their oil reserves. And given the fact that oil will likely not lose its relevance uh, so fast, um, this is only going to continue to be a strength for the UAE. Um, now, especially the Emirate of Dubai, but also more increasingly Abu Dhabi um, are really looking to yeah, to, to, to boost this uh, tourism aspect. And, um, uh, you know, they, they, they are, so to say, currently the tourism destination to be. There are a lot of attractions, uh, great hotels, uh, great entertainment options, and as well just as a, a big facet of, of shopping malls that um, you can go shopping on, on end. Um, and it makes it 
a huge tourist attraction overall. Now, the, the not so nice point or the, the weaknesses um, begin with the bureaucratic inconsistencies. So I, I do definitely here see again this word ambition come into play, um, but it mixes here with external pressures. So what we get as a result is that regulatory changes uh, can occur, you know, almost overnight. Um, this could potentially pose a hazard uh, for businesses um, because things just get changed very quick and, um, you know, on the fly. Uh, for example, uh, this year, we've actually uh, seen that just now with uh, about three weeks ago, the UBO register uh, being implemented with just a 60 day notice uh, period. And that actually flows into another uh, key weakness that I see, which is the, the partial untransparent regulation in the country. Um, what I mean with that is that due to these inconsistencies and things changing at such a rapid pace, you sometimes get the situation where um, the, the governmental institution that is uh, in charge of enforcing a new regulation or maintaining uh, balances and checks for these uh, aren't actually aware yet what to do and how to handle um, how to handle information uh, requests or or process the requirements. So, you know, as a business, you always want to you always want a fallback option. You want to be able to to get the information you need, and if that isn't possible uh, at all times, then that is definitely a weakness. Um, the next weakness is that the UAE is not actually a member uh, of the Hague Protocol. And what this means, so the Hague Protocol for business facilitation uh, really just sets a, a global standard for, for ease of legalization and preparation of documents. Um, now, not being a member of this agreement just basically means all of, all of these things are still possible. You can incorporate uh, stuff, you can legalize documents, but what you have is extra steps, extra steps that cost uh, both time, effort, oftentimes frustration, and also a lot more money than is needed uh, to be. So you would, for example, need to apostille and then super legalize entire sets uh, of business documents. It's really not only a daunting uh, process, but you know things can often go wrong and um, the mentality doesn't always help to streamline such uh, procedures. Uh, now, the, the next weakness I see is an over-dependence uh, on a few sectors. So we've already mentioned uh, oil, we've mentioned tourism. These two individually seen uh, in, in, in their sectors are, are definitely strengths and using them to the full advantage is something the, the country does very well. However, this at the same time means that they stand on just a few pillars. And if for whatever reason, uh, one of those was to break away, you know, they, they, they would fall harder because there is less to lean on, less other things. And this is why a, an over-dependence on a few sectors is never really something you want. Um, but it is definitely the situation in the UAE, despite these, uh, you know, more and more accelerated uh, diversification attempts. So they are aware, but at this moment, uh, it is still a major weakness of the country uh, that they that they haven't addressed appropriately. And last is, uh, yeah, the desert climate. It may it may sound quite silly, but if you think about it, um, especially in summer, the heat can get unbearable. We're talking about 52, 53, up to 55 degrees Celsius. And even with ACs being present virtually everywhere, um, it does overcomplicate, uh, you know, some aspects to both business, but also the day-to-day -day life in the UAE. 
just think that, that uh, you know you need to you need to legalize a document which you know takes longer there in in these procedures because they're not part of the Hague protocol and you're in a line of say waiting for two hours and you just uh, you walk out of your car to the to the uh, building and even though there may only be what 30 40 meters uh, it is so hot that you will immediately have a, a wave of heat hit you and sweat you feel uncomfortable uh, this carries over into the day and day life and although it isn't always directly con uh, connected to conducting business it will definitely affect the way you conduct business you'll have meetings inside you'll you know do all of these precautionary measures but all in all i do think that it's a weakness that there is that much to consider. Now moving on to uh, the opportunities and the threats. Now we've mentioned how the hub geography is, uh, is such a big strength and as such it's only natural that uh, this also serves as an opportunity. The facility to the two major emerging markets of our time, Asia and Africa, um, in many senses, this is already ongoing, that they are emerging, that they are growing. But in my opinion, this is only going to get stronger and happen at a quicker rate uh, in, in the future. And due to its geographic location uh, and due to the excellent infrastructure and connectivity, um, what, what we see is that since every relevant destination uh, can be reached, uh, there's just so much more of an easy access point um, that this really serves as a, as a large opportunity. Now, the next point is the access to new markets. I'm using here something very timely, which also was just agreed upon uh, not too long ago. Um, in fact, a, a few weeks or months uh, in the past where the Abraham Agreement was signed. Uh, which opened the insofar closed market of Israel up to the UAE. So, uh, you know, th this is again one of those one of those key aspects where we see this uh, we 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 see this uh, this move towards something new, towards establishing uh, you know a new way to create influx in business, especially now that we're in uh, the situation of a global pandemic, uh, they're, they're addressing it by finding ways to nonetheless boost the economy. Because even though many people, uh, you know, maybe, maybe having it very hard and maybe not so willing to invest, um, by opening or adding a new market that has previously been untouched, uh, this can kind of be overcome. And this is actually what we're seeing. There is a lot of hype around this. Now, the next opportunity is uh, what I already mentioned, the, the diversification process. So the country has realized it is a problem that we are standing on two or three or four feet. We need to have more you know, of, a, of, a, of a baseline. We need to have more of a foundation. And this is exactly what they're addressing uh, at, this, at this moment. And there are, there are massive ad, uh, efforts to, to you know, further accelerate this diversification. Um, and this really just hedges their bets against, for example, now, you know, you can imagine tourism in the UAE is uh, not doing well, as it is, you know, nowhere, uh, due to due to the ongoing uh, pandemic. And therefore, it's it's really, you know, forth looking and smart to to prepare to be aware that this is the case, and to prepare and diversify uh, market segments further. This is really the only acceptable call. And one way of this diversification uh, are these technological advances. And I, I see actually the technological advantages, uh, advances as the biggest advantage and the biggest opportunity for the country if played right. Um, because in the UAE, these are adapted super quickly. Um, so the moment you hear of any new technology, the UAE will jump on it and they will say, yes, we will be the first to do this. We will be the first to do that. Uh, you may have heard of things like the robot police or flying drone taxis and so forth. All of, all of these hyper 
uh, technological hyper futuristic things. And we now understand that most of these things are right now wishful thinking and they're not realistic at this point in time. But what puts the UAE in a good position is this mentality to lead the charge in terms of adapting to such technologies, because this does exist in the UAE. And I think it does exist at an unprecedented rate compared to any other place in the world. Uh, in this sense, they really are technological visionaries. And if they play this card right, as I said, this can be their biggest opportunity in the future. However, uh, with opportunities, there often also is the flip side of threats. Now, uh, if we've noticed one thing in the last few months, uh, it's that globally, the economy is frail, more frail than we thought. And this is also the case uh, in the UAE, uh, which COVID-19, this global pandemic has unmasked. Um, now, we could have never imagined because every major economy was kind of just a working system. You couldn't have imagined that, you know, you throw a rock into a keg and everything gets stuck. But this is exactly what is happening right now. And uh, in the UAE, especially uh, in Dubai, this was noticeable due to the breakdown of the tourism and the events uh, sector. Uh, a lot of people lost their job. Uh, people no longer came because, you know, some couldn't come and some were fearing to go. Uh, and this for a, a destination that really lives off this high society feel and this high volume tourism uh, turnover, it, it, it really challenges the, the, the underlying uh, structure, which is also why they are trying to speed up the diversification so that something like this cannot hurt them as much. So it's good that they're learning from it, but <clears throat> just like so many others, they weren't ready. And what this can lead into is the second point here, uh, which is the loss of investments. Now, in the UAE, uh, there are always a, a lot of, you know, foreign investments for big projects, big construction projects, sponsorships of, of big firms and so on. But what we've been noticing even before this crisis um, was just a, a steady decline of construction pro projects being realized. So what you would have, for example, is a, um, a, a, a living tower uh, for, for you know, private living spaces being finished, being built. Uh, there must have been so and so many people that signed up to rent out these apartments or buy them once it's finished. And it never even gets connected to the electricity or the water. They will just say, yeah, something is wrong. But in, in reality, they know that say 80% of it would stay uh, unoccupied and therefore to save face, they just say, yeah, you know, something didn't work. Um, as well as, you know, just so many major construction projects getting delayed time after time again. Um, you know, over time, this hurts the, the trust of investors. This uh, leads to a loss of investment. And uh, that, is a, that is a major, major threat uh, because even though, even though they have this, this uh, ambition to drive further and harder, uh, when they don't deliver, the fall is therefore uh, even more severe. Now, the, the next threat is uh, not so much internal, but an external threat, which is that other hubs could simply develop globally. Uh, now, the way I see it, uh, as of now, the UAE really offers something that is unmatched. Uh, I don't think anyone can uh, compete right now. But this doesn't mean that in 10, 15 years, this has to be the same way. There are other options that are slowly emerging. And while they may not yet be ready uh, to, to match this infrastructure, uh, it is only a matter of time until you know, when the calls that the UAE makes, makes are, are not the best or not correct, uh, that the UAE will be dethroned in this aspect um, if they really, you know, do not go with the times and adapt uh, appropriately. Now, uh, another external factor 
uh, but really comes also down to, to its location is uh, the effects of climate change. Now, I've already mentioned the, the unbearing summer heats and uh, you know, just imagine if this is bad now, what it does if it gets worse. Um, it may sound silly, but it, it really could uh, you know, diminish several opportunities that you know, people, investors, they may just stay away and look elsewhere. Uh, entire, entire production chains may not be realizable in the most efficient way. And then, you know, conducting them elsewhere where you would not have high cost to overcome this climate, uh, you know, can, can, can be seen and therefore people would take their projects elsewhere. Uh, this I see as a, as a real threat. And it's, it's not so much, there's not so much that they can do about it. Uh, they, they, they are you know, of course, going to be trying to handle that, uh, but it does remain a, a major threat. And the last one is actually the pegging to the US dollar. Uh, if you remember in the economic profile, we spoke about how the dirham is uh, pegged to the US dollar and how, especially in its infancy stage of the, of the country, this helped it out tremendously because it gave it stability, a backing, uh, something to rely on. But the way I see it, the economic future of the US currently is uncertain. Um, and we, we do reach a time where the pegging to the USD in, in the near future may actually cause more harm than it may cause good. This is, of course, open to see. Uh, time will tell. Um, but it is a threat that should be kept in mind uh, because, you know, <laughs> A, a, a collapse of the of the of the dollar even further um, would really be a rude awakening uh, for for the UAE in that aspect as well. Now, what we will talk about next is uh, the startup support and the question: Does it actually exist? We've covered a, a lot of um, a lot of the theoretical overview. Now, I want to see if you were to actually go through all of this. Uh, would, would there be support? Would there be government initiatives? Would there be incubators and accelerators to, to aid you in your process? Would you get support from banks? Uh, you know, how's the private equity situation? That's what we'll be looking into. The first uh, initiative, we've already spoken about it in the hypermarket uh, section, is this 100% foreign ownership promise. Now in the mainland, that is only partially available with some sectors, uh, not, not most. So for example, LLC is not, but it is increasing and who knows, uh, this could also in the future change. It is not so likely as of now, um, but this, this is something that is right now increasing and will at least reach uh, you know, some, 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 sort of, uh, some sort of moment where it's even more viable than right now. Uh, but you have the free zones and you have the offshore register where uh, all in all, you can be the 100% foreign owner uh, sponsor free in 125 business areas. Um, usually the way you would qualify for that uh, would be to, to invest more than a million uh, US dollars. Um, <clears throat> but in various sectors, uh, this could even move up as much as 20 million. So it, so it's quite a, quite a wide range. Um, another initiative uh, that, that has been going on and that has been developing is the modification of the visa or residency system and status. Uh, so there, there used to be you know, the saying that you will always be a guest in, in, in the UAE. And what we see now is uh, you know, more, more a shift of, of investor visas and such that, that are there you know, to make things easier for people that, that bring something to the market, in this case, money. Uh, you have the five-year, the 10-year, or the permanent residency, um, even something like the golden visa, uh, the aspect of no national sponsor, uh, and all the way up to eventual naturalization. Um, now, I, I spoke about you have to bring something you know, to them, to the market. Uh, for example, in the case of the five-year visa, you would have to invest $1.36 million uh, into the market uh, for the 10-year visa would be 2.725 million. That's a, quite a chunk, but 
this is an initiative that uh, you know does does allow um, yeah for 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 things to be easier than they were basically that's what it comes down to and um, in in terms of uh, SME support in in public projects it does exist but it's also something that I would say is very fresh and uh, it's not yet the most developed aspect uh, of of government uh, initiatives. So we have a 5% allocation of, of contract volumes, uh, which for example, in, in Dubai uh, would, would equal $110 million. Uh, and then we see an increase uh, in the allocation with 20% uh, for the Expo 2020 contract volumes. Now, an additional bonus there is that I believe the, uh, the payment terms are shorter from 90 to uh, 30 days uh, but since the expo has been po postponed now uh, yeah there's a lot of uncertainty involved in in that topic um, now a lot of initiatives lie and rest on these intensive efforts towards technology and technological advances um, so one of one of the country's visions actually is this this metamorphosis from this you know oil exporting country into a global hyper developed tech hub and in my opinion this is already you know reaching a stage where this would be a statement i wouldn't laugh at i could take that serious and say you know what you have a point here this is actually valid this is to a point true uh, for example, the UAE is the first country that established its own Ministry of Artificial Intelligence. They have an AI ministry. Um, and the way, the way that this, this metamorphosis is, is uh, transforming, it's with their constant rollout of these smart initiatives, uh, both G2C and G2G, uh, where, for example, uh, we, we, we now have to point happiness. Um, it's also the first country uh, with its own ministry of happiness. So you, you'll be driving down uh, one of the main roads uh, in the city and suddenly on, uh, I think it's to your left, on, on, a, on a government uh, building front, you just see this, this huge eight, nine meter circumference uh, smiley face. And then you know, yeah, that's the, that's the ministry of happiness. Um, they, they leverage their, their technologies, uh, mainly with, with blockchain and, and AI spoke about already how the ADGM uh, financial free zone <clears throat> uh, allows for, for these, these blockchain uh, developments. And, you know, it, it's one of those buzzwords that in, in the UAE will definitely turn heads. Um, then, you know, you have these, these ambitious claims that starting 2021, Dubai will be a paperless city. And you know, whether, whether that will happen or not, the one thing we should be able to agree on, uh, in my opinion, is that processes are lean, fast, and cheap in this regard. Uh, if you are interested in their, in their strategy in that regard, uh, you can check it up on uh, smartdubai.ae. We've, uh, we've put the link in here. So if, if this is something that interests you, you can check that out uh, afterwards. Um, and you know what? What we also see with this is a, perhaps a bit of a of a of a downside. But what we see with this inflation of these smart apps and services is that you really lose lose overview of of what is there and how many are there. And there's such a fluctuation with these apps being, you know, online then cut, uh, disturbed, and then taken offline. Um, and what's what's very funny with all of, the, all of these claims, yes, we'll go paperless, yes, everything can be done digital, is uh, the end point that for some reason uh, that is not yet identified, but they will find a way, you have to go to their office. Whatever reason it may be, they will still find a way uh, that even though everything of the procedure should be able to be done digitally, there will be a reason to, to drive down through the traffic and uh, you know get into a waiting line at said office. Now, <clears throat> I want to briefly talk about incubators and accelerators that uh, the country offers. Uh, 
like I said now at length, uh, there, there is a strong focus on technology, but what we see in the UAE is this pairing of technology with, yes, a, a, a sort of buzzword addiction. They, they keep adding, now similar to how in the dot-com bubble, everything was suddenly dot-com. Uh, in, in the UAE, you see this same scenario and this phenomena uh, with AI, autonomous, 3D, blockchain and, and such terms. Uh, they really, you really try to build these uh, buzzwords in to, yeah, to, 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 to gain, uh, gain attention and to, to make a wave because they know that this is what's in right now. This is what's in. Um, there is still in these uh, accelerators and incubators a, a clear focus uh, and embedding uh, in their general amortization policy that I spoke about uh, earlier. So there's a, a lot of initiatives to bring these young Emiratis away from government jobs into, for example, entrepreneurship, into tech-based uh, you know, projects. The exception uh, is really just everywhere where, where any tech is seen as, yeah, coming from abroad, uh, where it's not homegrown, homebrewed. Uh, here are some of the, the big players. Uh, and it's, it's actually UAE's sovereign funds, um, which are primarily not for startups. You would think uh, that they would be. You have the, the ADIA, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority or office, uh, nearing 700 billion US dollars. Uh, the ICD and Mubadala Investment Company uh, from Dubai and Abu Dhabi respectively, uh, closing in at, at 230 to 240 billion US dollars. Uh, and then you even have the, the Emirates Investment Authority uh, coming in at 45 uh, billion dollars. So there are definitely, uh, there, there, there are definitely authorities, federations, companies, groupings uh, that are there. But in my opinion, if it's not primarily going to startups, it is not going uh, in the right direction. And we'll hear more, hear more about this later. Now here on this slide, I will not go into uh, any specific uh, aspect of these, but we've just compiled a selection of accelerators, incubators and tech hubs. So if this is something that interests you and you want to see, okay, you know, what, what is there, what, what exists? Um, you can take a look at it. Uh, you can click through the links and yeah, you can see if, if, there's, if there's anything that interests you with that. And now, We'll talk about the support from the banks. Yes, support from banks uh, is a little bit uh, critically seen uh, a white sheet. There is not so, so not so much support from banks, but this is meanwhile I think not only here a regional problem problem or a country problem. This is generally a problem of the banking sector. We have indeed uh, a start and SME friendly claim of all our banks because this belongs to the good tone. Uh, entrepreneurs, small and medium-sized enterprises are in the marketing gibberish and wording of nearly every bank. Uh, but this is only the good tone, not more, not less. The SME banking itself is, of course, in any bank an existing and established department. This has to be seen. But it remains a challenge to get a, bank, a current bank account. Uh, the high minimum balances are hindering many companies uh, to do it in a flexible way. It starts from $10,000 and can go up to $100,000, which is especially for a startup, quite a huge bunch of money. Uh, we have here also the situation that FinTechs are a little bit uh, on the march forward and we expect but we also hope that this will change a little bit maybe also due to the actual pandemic situation where um, you cannot be so picky anymore like like it was before as a bank sme credit facilities are a separate chapter we have to see here the tradition in uae banking eligibilities for entities uh, to borrow the money and so on are usually defined let the entity first become older than three years 
then it is being seen as serious, stable, continuing to exist, and so on and so on. Risk management and over collateralization are like in every other finance market, meanwhile, also massive bottlenecks. Risk management is this high practicing of compliance, which takes a lot of time with huge questionnaires and over collateralization is also nothing country specific that normally your collaterals have to have a higher value than the credit facility which you want to take. Um, here in the country, due to the legal pitfalls of, of credit facilities, which would lead too far, it is so, so from very many people an advice against going to classic banks and utilize their classic credit facilities. Uh, of course, our banks here offer some placebos, especially for SMEs, we call it fintech clones and blueprints, which are just powered by banks. These are at the end mobile banking applications just with a touch, but it has got nothing to do with something new or like fintech when we when we take companies like N24 or, or other international active uh, fintechs. We have their old wine in new bottles and it's of course called Neobis, which is Mashrek Bank, a very established bank, LIF which is Emirates National Bank of Dubai or Money Smart Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank. So um, it's, it's uh, the normal classic situation, how, it, how to deal, especially from the perspective of a startup or SME with banks. The private equity, venture capital and funds sector is also relatively young and can be overseen very easily because we have 84 VC and PE firms, we have to consider always that there is always a, list, a rate of 20 to 25%. We call it the, the wannabe rate. Uh, listed VC funds, which are actually either themselves on the, on the search for a funding, or they are not investing at the moment, or they are even de-investing. This shows also a little bit the statistics of tech startup funding in 2018. The funding was valued here with a volume of 390 million US dollar, uh, distributed on 110 tech startup deals. In 2019, uh, that figure went slightly down, but the number of deals remained on more or less the same level. So the allocated amount of startup funding per each project went in the volume really remarkable down. So the segment is by that small and relatively clear uh, when it comes to VC, PE, angel funds. Um, and we can also see that under the top 10 active investors here in the country alone, five sovereign funds or government owned free zones or accelerators are acting. Mubadala, ICD, Flat6 Labs, you will find this on this accelerator list, 2454 uh, and Dubai Silicon Oasis. So it is very government heavy weight in this top 10. And last but not least, a positive aspect, uh, which needs to be considered that many established business conglomerates here in UAE. So traditional companies which exist over decades already, mostly owned by, by UAE citizens. They are also active as an investor, but they don't go much public about it or promote themselves as an investor. But they, I am quite sure, they even overload tech startup funding volumes like 250 million US dollar per year. A very Quick run with a back in the with a back in the hand is the facilitation question. How to start here a business? Yeah, uh, we sorted it a little bit in 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 several steps: uh, jurisdiction evaluation and selection, incorporation and structural cost frames, administration procedures, pitfalls. I want to go mainly on the last two points. 
Here in the jurisdiction evaluation, that is a standard process, which is also here recommendable in this country, especially with view to this huge amount of different economic jurisdictions, which you can select. For, don't remember more than 53 zones, mainland in different Emirates and so on. So you should judge the jurisdiction category primarily by your market approach in a first step. If I'm focusing on the mainland or on my domestic market, I look for a mainland setup. If I focus in overseas markets, I go for a free zone setup. I focus on both. I must make a combination of both actually still where I have my free zone entity and then maybe a mainland distributor or my own branch. And if I focus on conveying of invoices, IP and commissioning, um, I can look for an offshore setup. Then the second step is, of course, to localize this jurisdic my jurisdiction candidates. Okay, I selected now free zone, but which free zone? Um, we have this cluster focus of jurisdictions, thematic free zones we said before. We have operational jurisdiction features to be considered. How do they work? How do they work with the administration? Have they maybe also several offices in the country that it is easing your administrative work when you deal with them? Uh, then your own geographical preferences. Do you want to be somewhere a little bit more far away from the high life in Dubai or Abu Dhabi? Um, what is with your distance between living and working? And last but not least, also for the localization of the candidates, the pricing of structural cost and the residency cost plays a role. They all have different schemes for their rents, for their license fees, for some primary setup expenses and so on. In the third step, we would always recommend to perform a feasibility about the jurisdiction candidates to look deeper into it when I have a first selection of let's say four candidates and I want to find the one and only the more you come into productive business the more interesting are of course these cost parameters like rent electricity water gas because they vary extremely in a federation that is normal this is in every federal country the same situation but also the checkup of communication quality provider versus provider, checking the bandwidth which is available uh, in a certain free zone, the connectivity for the individual transportation and for the public transportation when it comes to the point, okay, how can I reach my workplace? Uh, is it also easy for employees? Um, then we said before the ease of administration processes to set up an entity uh, is that practiced well by the candidate or not. And last but not least, we always say visit the candidate to get a look and feel. After that, when you have a result matrix, you should always cross check because marketing is practiced everywhere. They tell you a lot of things like everywhere in the world. But when it comes down to the reality, there is a fine print. So you can consult at any time here. It is very well practiced jurisdiction administrations, a free zone administration, a free zone authority, because they all have one stop agency ideas, one stop, they even call it here red tapes. That is nothing what is diversing. This, this shall guide the people to the right point. They have, some of them have even dialogue centers where you just can walk in, talk with the people and say, okay, I made here my matrix, what would you say? Is this, this and this feature which I found out about your free zone, is this correct and so on. You can also, the more it comes into an entrepreneurial scenario, let's say in, in free zones which are for IT techies and so on, just jump in already established offices or companies and ask and talk with the people who are already localized there and had finished already the facilitation process. It's very open-minded there. And there is, till now we never found the situation that someone says, oh, I don't want to talk about it. Last but not least, you can also consult business helpers, advisors or law firms like everywhere in the world and like everywhere in the world, they cost money. And point five is then 
in the jurisdiction evaluation and selection to decide. That is very roughly that process, which is, of course, as Philip said right in the beginning, uh, in the introduction, this cannot give here now a blueprint how to set up my company, but it shows a little bit the general guidelines. The incorporation and structural cost frames, just shortly for a better comparison, we just selected here the setup and structural cost means your operational parameters vary for each business case, how much office you need, how many people and so on. But license fees, auditing fees, uh, no, auditing fees, not incorporation fees, um, they, they are standing here in a comparison between mainland, free zone, financial free zone and offshore. You can study it deeper also than in the handout. And we also made it without auditing fees, ESR and other com compliance charges, because this is also depending from each individual uh, jurisdiction and localization. The administration procedure itself, it's quite with varieties from authority to authority, of course, but the, they have all more or less a similar workflow, which are five steps. You have a pre and company trade name approval where you also get checked with criminal and database uh, look up of, of the applicants. Um, duplication name check plays your more and more role. Then you have the signing and the attestation of incorporation documents, the related contracts, the registration of the entity itself and the members, means the shareholders, the directors. Then the corporate deck documents will be delivered to you more and more in an electronic delivery or also via courier. And then your entity is ready for all the follow up contractings to become active and living. So you can go to the electricity and water authority, make the contract for your office uh, to the telecommunication provider and so on. Pitfalls. Pitfalls we have in three areas. Area number one is a mentality. And this is also nothing country specific, but it's a pitfall also here. Cultural competence should be as seen as essential when you deal here with locals. That is a very important point. They are sometimes very traditional. I can give you an example. If you guys as male go in a government office and a local woman is sitting there as employee, it is absolutely a no-go that you are the one who is stretching out the hand to shake it. At the moment, so or so, we don't shake hands. But under normal circumstances, you stand a little bit back and wait what the lady is deciding to do. 50% of them will offer their hand, then you can take it and shake it. The other 50% do not, and then you do just like this. Yeah. Um, and the Special thing here is especially in, 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 government, in the government area and the public sector, it is also good to, to practice cultural competence when dealing with non-locals, including those ones who would like to be locals, but are not. Sometimes they do as if they are, but they are not. Yeah? Second pitfall in the mentality, English. English is here the absolute clearly established working language. No doubt about that, but it is not the official administration language. Official administration language is Arabic. And for example, in the Emirate of, of Abu Dhabi, when you deal there with the government, you do not survive without Arabic. They have the same, they all can speak English indeed, and very good English, but they have the same typical arrogancy like you can find it, for example, in France. When you go to France and start to speak with French people English, they will show you they do not understand you. They insist on it that you speak French with them. The same in Abu Dhabi. Then I called it early birds leave their offices also early. You have to live with it that uh, government authorities 
open their offices at 7 a.m. in the morning, sometimes even earlier, which is for all of us normally not a time where we have still our eyes open. And because they start so early, they also close early. So normally when you deal with government, for example, in the setup of your company, the day is finished at 2 p.m. And then comes very often Bukra. Bukra is, uh, means tomorrow. It's an Arabic term, uh, but tomorrow, not in the way of tomorrow. You know, when the Spains, the Spanish say manana or South Africans say just now, and they are referring not to actually tomorrow, but to some undetermined time in the future, whenever someone gets around to it. It could be tomorrow, physically, day after tomorrow, next week, next month. Well, Bukra is the Arabic e equivalent to this manana. I don't know if there's one specific term in that direction in Thai language, yeah? <laughs> Maybe you can help us with that. We can edit that. Um, you have to ask then, the guys or the, there are some non ties as well here, but there are yeah. some ties, someone from Myanmar, from China. Um, so they could say if there is something like that. <laughs> the, 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 the international version of Bukra. <laughs> Bukra. Yes, sir. I think in Thai Prungni is tomorrow. <laughs> it's yeah, really but this man said really tomorrow. Yeah, really tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, processes. We have a high speed, uh, Philip talked also about it in this process digitization, also out of the ambition and in the automation, the smart solutions, smart offices, smart processes. But we have, due to that, because the speed is very high, also sometimes hand and egg scenarios, yeah, that, for example, in the algorithmic follow up of a process, the six, step number six comes as step number three by mistake. It's not well sorted at the moment, must be proven more and then re-implemented. We have also, especially in administration, very often a frequent escape from the system back to the paper. Uh, because also sometimes these systems, because of the high speed and the high growth of smart systems, we have also a system down situation that simply the idle status of smart systems, which are all internet and few computer dependent, that they are 10 to 15 percent with 10 to 15 percent idle status that the system is down or very slow. Yeah, I give you an example. I made yesterday um, a, a property transfer in the Dubai land department. Yesterday was Thursday the last working week of, of the day. Normally you should never do that on a Thursday on a Sunday because Thursdays and Sundays, the system is completely overloaded because external registration agents are all making access to the database in the land department. And the process itself takes an three times longer. So I was sitting there instead of one hour, three hours. That, that's three times longer. Um, translations from English to Arabic and Arabic to English are really essentially important. Just consider again, in case of disputes and or doubts, the administration language, the official language of the country is Arabic and not English. So your English wording in an English Arabic contract, for example, or POA or so counts nothing. Uh, when there are any doubts, then only counts what is standing there in Arabic. Uh, by the way, wave Google Translate under all circumstances, it will not give you any suitable result of uh, an Arabic text translated into English. Last but not least, legal lawsuits require here an Arabic lawyer, ultimately, and also requested by the law. For example, I, as a lawyer, being not Emirati, being not UA citizen, I cannot represent companies in front of the court. I could not do it so anyways, because I don't speak Arabic, but even if I would be famous in Arabic, I could not represent. This is a closed shop because we have here this local and federal court system, which is very traditional and where they are very proud on that. Of course, there are some more pitfalls I would also not see it too negative. I would say considerables, uh, but let's leave it for that and come to the end to the critical pathways.
Yes. Uh, so for the end, uh, I would like to explore some critical pathways and leave you with, yeah, also some thoughts of, uh, you, you know, what, what about it is good? What about it uh, could be improved? And the, the first point uh, that we're having here is uh, the often discussed in this presentation aspect of ambition, uh, but here as a downfall. So I've mentioned uh, that you know, what, what made the UAE surge seemingly out of nowhere into this, this, this hyper-modern destination um, and this developed state, uh, that aspect is ambition. It's, it's this pull for more. And the one thing that all UAE leaders uh, have had in common is that they were dreamers. They reached for the stars. And the moment they got there, they didn't just stop. They decided to go further. They want to test their limits at all times. And the UAE is, is always trying uh, their best to be at the forefront of every technological development, of every smart solution, of every vision. They are pioneering every technological development. If you think about that, that is very positive. Uh, this ambition creates drive that creates progress because if you do not aim high, you will not, uh, you know, you will not put in adequate uh, work because you don't think you need to. But the problem with this, and I've, I've alluded to this earlier, is that if something goes wrong with the most grand claim, uh, this can lead to a bigger downfall than otherwise uh, would, would you know, maybe be happening. And even today, uh, many critics of the UAE, and especially Dubai, because this is the place you would hear most about, um, they already see it as the place that wants to do everything, but actually achieves very little. Um, it's certainly true that they want to do everything, <laughs> um, but I don't think that it's true that they achieve little. The problem is, that their own ambition puts the bar so high that the expectations are just very hard to exceed. And if then something goes wrong, uh, over time it can severely damage the image for investors, for tourism, for, for, you know, for such kind of things. And over time, this can hurt. Uh, so for example, a, a great anecdote for this is um, when I myself, was in Dubai uh, in the last summer, um, I was offered to purchase property uh, for the new project, uh, the Dubai Creek Tower. If you Google that, it's, it's this grandiose, complex design and this, this, this vision of, you know, I, I couldn't even put it into, into a sentence. And they were just offering me office space uh, or, or even residential space uh, while I was just strolling around in a shopping mall. I, I was in, in casual clothing. I wasn't wearing anything special. Um, and it just approached me like this, giving me the, the biggest promises ever. You know, this will be done in 2020, no matter what. Uh, you know, th th this will be ready. You'll be able to, you'll be able to move in. And, you know, I, I insisted that I don't believe this can be the case because at the time, uh, construction was nowhere near finishing. Uh, now, of course, as you can imagine, uh, the project is completely frozen. Um, and I think that even without the global pandemic, the developments wouldn't have been in a way that this would have been ready at all. Uh, but, but the promise is there, the selling aspect is there, and they, they just keep pushing for it. They keep pushing for these, these unrealistic targets. Uh, not, not because they just want to lie, but it's, it's because they actually believe that. They believe they can do that if they believe it. And more often than not, I would say it does go the right way. Uh, my next point in this is uh, over-regulation, the complex horizon of, of what is regulation. So we've, we've identified that there is a lot of attractive perks for business in the UAE. You know, from, from taxation to the geolocation, uh, its free zone perks and, and just its variety of, of offerage uh, in terms of what you can do to conduct business. Uh, it is definitely by any means a top destination for business, 
But part of that actually lies in the fact that there is this very loose regulation. Um, and when we then see an influx of, of regulation, uh, the, you know, it, it could potentially scare off uh, business or investors. Now, for example, a 5% VAT rate isn't going to, to you know, suddenly make you change your mind and not go to the UAE because there are still so many other perks uh, that, that this easily overcomes. But if suddenly there's this fear, this developing fear that there could be more, there could be more without any notice, there could be more without any support, this can definitely scare business owners away. So changes like this year, the economic substance regulation in April or the UBO register in October, which I, I told you it was established within just 60 days uh, without the official institutions even being fully aware of what to do. Uh, this can just create this, this, this spark of unrest and doubt in, in business and investors. And I think it's a, it's a very fine line to get regulation right, uh, because while you want to be attractive uh, for, for, for business owners, you of course also want to you know, play all the right cards so that uh, you, have a, you have a good structure, you have a good infrastructure of business and business facilitation. And I think this is really something they need to be careful with uh, that they do get right because it is very easy to reach a tipping point where you know this could become too much. Now, the next critical aspect I see is the development of other regional hubs. We've spoken at length about why the UAE uh, is such a great hub, but what happens if the need for such a hub is reduced? If these regional hubs that are being accessed through the UAE suddenly develop in a way that this easy access point diminishes because it is no longer necessary. Again, things like this to, to catch up with the level that we're talking about here with the UAE, it would take years to even realize half as smooth uh, operation as for example, the DXB airport. But it is this, this, this looming threat and this, this critical aspect that should definitely be taken uh, into consideration. And lastly, I think this is something that doesn't just apply to the UAE, but in general, it's the readjustment to the new normal. How will this look as a post COVID society? How will they deal with uh, the digital developments? Um, and you know, just, just like every place globally, the UAE will need to find ways to adapt given uh, the pandemic and given what is happening right now. Uh, there may be changes in healthcare aspects, uh, but also eventual shifts in human interaction uh, or even cultures. We don't know that yet. Uh, this all comes out of, out of this pandemic. And for example, while the digital license is already a good step and a good start in the right direction to, to, to boost digital SMEs and other uh, companies that want to utilize the online space or social media, um, Corona will most definitely further impact and drive a technological shift away from more traditional measures. So like MICE, we spoke about meetings, uh, incentives uh, and, and the, the exhibitions um, and towards more conducting online business. Uh, now, for example, the best example for this is actually this lecture right now. You know, we, we, we are speaking here by a Zoom call uh, instead of me standing right in front of you. You're having online classes. All of these aspects uh, wouldn't have been so frequently used as you see them being used around the world now. What we are seeing is this adaptation and the way the UAE will adapt to this is really what will, I think, be the most prominent factor in whether it will uh, turn out as a, as a you know, future state of growth and success, or whether if it does poorly at that, it could even crumble. And I do think that, especially for the upcoming years and with uh, technology developing so quick during, uh, during this pandemic, I think it was estimated that three years of technological progress were fit into four or five months with the big tech companies. This is a big opportunity if you do it right. But if you don't do it right, it could be the biggest downfall. And I think that is really the, the last thought I want to leave you with um, because it is, 
it is the thing that could become the biggest asset of the future for this country. But at the same time, it could also be the biggest stepping stone for future success. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you <laughs> for sharing this with us and for sharing so many details. And uh, maybe we can go back to the students and um, to the few who joined today and ask if there are any questions, any comments, anything you want to know, anything that came to your mind. Anybody wants to open a business in Dubai or in UAE? Hello? Yeah, Tarin. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Tarin. Tarin, your microphone is muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, no. I'm so sorry. I just wanted to ask that is Thailand and a Dubai relationship fine in the economy term? In economy term, there is not so much business taking place, surprisingly, uh, between UAE and Thailand. Um, the UAE and Thailand axis is happening mainly on the level of healthcare. We have a very, very strong channel of healthcare tourism from UAE into mm -hmm. Thailand, yeah. which has got to do with your absolute worldwide leading excellent hospitals, I must admit. Yeah? And on the other side, it has got to do with the fact that uh, the healthcare sector here is also well developed, but extremely expensive. Yeah? So uh, if you want to lose your belly fat, for example, you pay in Thailand just 20% of the doctor's fee and, and, and clinic fees, which you would pay here. So it's cheaper for you to buy a ticket, fly to Bangkok and make it there. And also you combine it with a nice holiday. Economical cooperation is given, of course, on diplomatic way and so on. Um, but you don't see many active Thai companies here in UAE, for example. Uh, and the other way around, I think I did not analyze that too deep. The other way around, it is more or less the same. Mm. Mm. All right, thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, I wondered when when um, Philip said that one of the opportunities is that um, UAE is so you know, jumping on technologically hyper futuristic, whatever devices or um, pieces that if, if there is someone in Thailand who has this super high tech product, if it might make sense, if, if the, maybe the customer is the end consumer to go and start it in Dubai because you have access to at least these 9 million people, 10 million people Let's maybe spread the region from there and grow it faster than growing it in Southeast Asia. I don't know. What do you think? I think, I think definitely yes, because when you compare, for example, really things like available funds, uh, incubation and acceleration, this has been especially over the last three, four years developed tremendously. Yeah? Uh, it's also now, meanwhile, more or less a good tone for a free zone authority. And again, we have more than 50 that each of them is in any way somehow offering something like startup support, entrepreneurial support, and so on. Um, you saw the list, and you can review it later in the, in the handout of, of, of the slides. Um, the, 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 the richest sovereign funds are here. And although they are not, of course, addressable from, from the perspective of a startup, the sovereign funds on the other side go also down in this accelerator and incubator field. Uh, you can see that later when you follow a little bit the links. Um, approximately a third of these big lists of accelerators and incubators are somehow connected to the sovereign funds. So here is for innovative ideas, for innovative technologies is, first of all, is money available. Second, the interaction places are meanwhile, and I think especially COVID situation brought there a positive effect. We have here now more places of interaction. We have an increase in co-working spaces because everywhere you have it also in Thailand, 
the traditional office space is dropping down and the need is decreasing. What is massively going up are co-working spaces for where punctually the people interact with each other. And we see it here more and more, situations which I never would have ex expected to see here in this country, for example, for five or four years ago, that you have melting pots where people meet, discuss their ideas. So it's a very young and fresh situation, especially since we finished our lockdown here and the people started breathing again. Yeah, And this we have... Thanks God, we have here, we cannot say that we have here a second wave because we have constantly per day uh, in comparison to Europe, lousy 1,000, 1,200 new infection cases, which is look to Europe, look, uh, look in, in, in some other countries, uh, which is really nothing. So the people can breathe more, okay, under these uh, security aspects and, and measurements with, because of COVID, but they also do it. Yeah, interesting. Because I think that, I mean, there is also funding in, in, in this part of Asia for tech products and also the Thai government tries to really promote tech startups, uh, especially money from Japan and from Singapore um, coming in here. I didn't hear from that UAE money is um, or investment companies are targeting Asian startups. I never heard about that. Um, <clears throat> I always hear about Japanese and Singaporean companies. So the Japanese money is the big money and the Singaporean money is a more smaller investment. That's what is generally, um, you know, what we see here. But UAE, if I see um, the different funds you have, you have more funds than we have in Thailand. Yeah, good. The sovereign funds, they are investing really worldwide, but this is on a very high level, industrial level and so on. And, and of course they are also engaged not highly engaged, they are traditionally more engaged in the US and in Europe. Yeah. Um, you, must, you must look back on that, on that slide, VC and PE funds. First of all, it's a small number of institutions. Let's call them institutions. Um, that's the first aspect. The second aspect is indeed uh, you have as a, an additional driver there, of course, here, these local conglomerates. They are very pragmatically normally with their investment policy because they say, okay, we invest in something which is here then now our new distribution product or our new structure where we do something here in the country, even then to go into export or into service rendering outside in the world. Yeah? I think it has got to do with the aging stadium of that VCPE market here. Mm -hmm. And it's very young. Yeah. yeah. So when this is reaching a critical number or a critical aging, that will automatically automatically come that they look for new markets. Hmm. I, anybody has question? I have. I have more. I always have. Um. <laughs> um. What about crowdfunding in UAE? UAE is it a case or not? It I mean, is, so and, here. here's, here's not much, so I'm just it curious. Is, and it is not. not. Uh, there are some, some of, of the incubators start slowly, but they are very, very unsure and even shy because they never know, does this fit still here to the regulation? Because we have a, we have a very, very strict uh, cyber law. Oh, yeah. So crowdfunding is collecting money. Um, it starts, we have no own crowdfunding platform. Yeah, 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 sure. And everyone who makes your crowdfunding should normally be when you follow the regulation of that cyber, cyber law. They call it even cyber crime law. They grab it directly by the name. It's not a cyber law, it's cyber crime law. Um, you should have a license. Uh, but I am not aware about even an activity code here in the catalog of activities, uh, which would cover crowdfunding. Yeah, but so if you're so regulated also, I forgot about that, that you, that Philip said you're a highly regulated country and I know that crowdfunding in highly regulated economies, it's, it's no way, no way. 
we have here we have here also although adgm is 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 really for uh, uh, cyber uh, uh, for for cryptocurrency for blockchain with own regulation uh, i give you an example i just had yesterday the conversation with a client from poland who contacted me they have a free zone company here they make e-commerce they make some e-consulting services via webcam and so on which is nothing special today yeah? and uh, he reported to me that he did not get a bank account opened because he was owner of a cryptocurrency company in estonia and he has it in his cv and he even did close that company in estonia for the purpose that the bank here opens him an account but they said no we don't know. you had one time to do with this bad bad cryptocurrency we don't want to be in touch with you yeah so it is mm. it is a fun, funny time at the moment and the same counts for for crowdfunding which will be in future definitely be something which will establish but i think it will be swapped over from outside from the american crowdfunding market that maybe the first platform say come Let's do here something in the Middle East with an own subsidiary. And then they must start to think about how to give these guys a license. Mm, yeah. And uh, uh, one last question. Um, the... Are you sure? <laughs> 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 the conglomerates. Um, we just had in GEM, and I didn't read it yet because it's maybe two weeks old, the new family business report coming out. And we have really very many, 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 many. I think Thailand tops the list in this report. I only read the summary for family businesses. And um, the question for me is, do you have them in the UAE? Are those family businesses or are those, yes. yeah, also family yes. businesses? Yes. Mm. You can say each and every here seen in the mainland, in the domestic market, each and every conglomerate is a family, family business. Uh, meanwhile, in the second or even third generation. Yeah? Uh, these conglomerates, you always see, even the company name is usually a family name. For example, MAF is Majid Al Futain. Majid Al Futem has got here the distribution rights for Carrefour supermarkets, IKEA, Ace, uh, Toyota, mm -hmm. Lexus, uh, and, and, and this is just 25% of that conglomerate. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's it's always in these conglomerates also a crude mix of activities which is not based on synergies. It is based on, no, there's one synergy they have all in common. Their synergy to build up such, this is money. They want to earn money, of course, yeah? But they do not look for synergies in their portfolio. Mm. They look, where is an attractive product? Ah, it is not represented here in the country. I make a distribution agreement. They are traditionally in, Middle East, also in Asia, once a distribution contract is made and registered, it is very, very difficult to break that up again. So it's being something which then will be inherited to the next generation. And there we have here a lot. Yes. Yeah, no, thanks a lot for sharing. So if my students... Made a lot of fun and it was a great pleasure for us. Philip, I think I can speak also yeah. for you. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks you for for joining twice today. Um, for those who joined late here to this class or later, um, uh, both of them joined for the morning class as well. And this means for Philip it was 3 a.m. in the morning, and for Martin oh. it was 6 a.m. in the morning. And so um, I don't want to keep you too long now, um, because I really appreciate it. And and we're going to get to the slides, and so I'm going to share the slides, and whoever wants to catch up can do so. And who has questions popping up um, I'm happy yeah to yeah also reachable <laughs> after this at any time for further yeah. questions so if someone wants to know something that is absolutely no question and as you have seen when it comes especially to this tech oriented entrepreneurial things the junior is a better counterpart <laughs> H level is probably also equivalent no <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes that's the next aspect for that yeah. right 
Okay, so um, 